Well, good morning, Pastor Andre here. Uh, thanks for joining us or joining us with this sermon resource, this section of our uh, Sunday service. If you're new to Emmanuel Church, uh, I would like to encourage you not to ever see uh, this sermon or this uh, online resource uh, as a replacement of the local church. Please do contact a local pastor of a local church in your area. But our intention, our hope, our prayer for this is ultimately that it grows your affections for Jesus, uh, that your understanding of the gospel and the reality of that is strengthened uh, in your life. Uh, if you would like to give towards the work of the ministry at Emmanuel, you'll find all of those details online at our website. Uh, but most importantly, here's to growing in Christ together. Good morning, everyone. The reading from the scriptures this morning is taken from the book of 1 Samuel. Chapter 24. 1 Samuel, chapter 24. When Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the wilderness near En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 of Israel's fit young men and went to look for David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. When Saul came to the sheep pens along the road, a cave was there, and he went in to relieve himself. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. So they said to him, Look, this is the day the Lord told you about. I will hand your enemy over to you, so you can do to him whatever you desire. Then David got up and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, I swear before the Lord, I would never do such a thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. I will never lift my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. With these words, David persuaded his men, uh, and he did not let them rise up against Saul. Then Saul left the cave and went on his way. After that, David got up, went out of the cave, and called to Saul, My lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David knelt low with his face to the ground and paid homage. David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of the people who say, look, David intends to harm you? You can see with your own eyes that the Lord handed you over to me today in the cave. Someone advised me to kill you, but I took pity on you and said, I won't lift my hand against my Lord since he is the Lord's anointed. Look, my father, look at the corner of your robe in my hand, for I cut it off but I didn't kill you. Recognize that I've committed no crime or rebellion. I haven't sinned against you, even though you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between me and you, and may the Lord take vengeance on you for me, but my hand will never be against you. As the old proverb says, wickedness comes from wicked people. My hand will never be against you. Who has the king of Israel come after? What are you chasing after, a dead dog, a single flea? May the Lord be judge and decide between you and me. May he take notice and plead my case and deliver me from you. When David finished saying these things to him, Saul replied, Is that your voice, David, my son? Then Saul wept aloud and said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have done what is good to me, though I have done what is evil to you. You yourself have told me today what good you did for me. When the Lord handed me over to you, you didn't kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go unharmed? May the Lord repay you with good, for what you've done for me today. Now I know for certain you will be the king, 
the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. Therefore swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David swore to Saul. Then Saul went back home, and David and his men went up to the stronghold. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray before I start. Father, every word of this story, every word of your Bible, ultimately comes from you. What a privilege we have to be able to turn to it and seek your face. Not just know that there's maybe and possibly a God out there who might or might not have any interest in us. But to know that you love us that you direct the course of our lives. And that we are here for a purpose that is given by you. And we're here this morning for a purpose given by you, to learn from your word. Please teach us, teach us this morning. May we not leave this place unchanged. Amen. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go unharmed? That was verse 19 of the story. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go unharmed? Now, in the circumstances, it is a rhetorical question. Saul did not expect an answer. It was Saul who asked the question. Because he asked it of the very man, his enemy, who had just done that. Who'd just done that. David was a man who had just found his enemy and let him go unharmed. But it was a good question to ask. Saul had some insight there. How is it that David let him go? How exactly is it that David didn't grab his opportunity? Saul was out hunting for his blood. Hunting for his blood. And, and there, in the moment, David could have fixed it all taken Saul down in an instant. How is it that David let him go? So you can rephrase this question, what kind of man finds his enemy yet lets him go unharmed? What kind of man does that? as we make our way through the story, we can pick out four things about this kind of man. And by the end, we should have a clear idea why this man is so different to those around him. This man doesn't do what Saul and we would have expected him to do. And that is take advantage of the situation. Well, the first difference we pick up 
is that this kind of man does not primarily depend on people for his confidence, for his support, for his strength. By way of contrast, let's have a look at Saul. Let's go back to the beginning of that chapter, verses 1 and 2. We see Saul's dependence. We see what he relied upon. When Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the wilderness near En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 of Israel's fit young men and went to look for David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. Let's be frank, man, uh, Saul is a man of power. He was the king. Let's not decrease his status. He was the king. He was head of the army. He could call on these fit young men at a notice. I, I, I wonder, these poor guys have just been pursuing the Philistines. They must have been, you know, reflecting on some time back home, some time of rest. We've done our duty. We need time off. But Saul has the power to say, come, we're going. We're going to hunt down David. Saul's confidence as he goes on the hunt of the Philistines and of David is in the physical strength of his fit young men. But secondly, it's in human advice. And, and David points it out. Have a look at verse 9. David said to Saul, why do you to the listen to the words of people who say, look, David intends to harm you? Saul was a man, like many of us, who looks for things to strengthen our position, whether it's physical power, or it's the advice of others. We see it more and more on social media. This person did this to me. What do you people think would be the right thing that I should do back to that person? Let's put it out on social media because, of course, if we can get a lot of people to agree with what I want to do, then it must be right. That, that's that's the, the ground upon which I launch into my next course of action. But David was different. He said, you can see with your own eyes that the Lord handed you over to me today in the cave. Someone advised me to kill you. But I took pity on you and said, I won't lift my hand against my Lord since he is the Lord's anointed. David chose to defy the advice he was given, chose to disagree with it. Clearly, David was not a man who got his dependence, got his strength, got his support and encouragement from mankind. We'll come to where he got it from, but we need to know that up front. Primarily, he did not get it from mankind. Now, as I've chatted about this with friends and family, the question has been put to me, and it's a fair question. Do we dis utterly disregard all dependence on people? Do we just, you know, you cannot ad handle advice from a person. I think the, the thing we need to see is that for David, it was not his primary dependence. Whatever advice he was given, whatever support, whatever strength, it was filtered through another, another. And there's a clue in there. He would never lift my hand against my Lord 
since he is the Lord's anointed. That is his primary strength. It's not the opinion of man. It's not an army. David had his own little army. I tried to find what size his army in the cave might have been, but it was a cave. But his primary dependence was the Lord. The second thing we can learn from this kind of man, he has a growing sensitivity of conscience. Have a look at verses 4 and 5. So his men said to him, David, look, this is the day the Lord told you about. I will hand your enemy over to you so you can do to him whatever you desire. Then David got up and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe. I spend most of this week thinking, really? (laughs) Really? This man is hunting your blood. He wants to stomp you into the ground. And you sitting feeling guilty for cutting off a corner of his robe. I put it to my son. I got the impression he felt the same way as me. A corner of his robe? Come on. This man's hunting your life. Stop worrying about whether you cut off a corner of his robe or what. He deserved far worse than that. It sounds so over the top. Such a sensitive little conscience. But I have to ask myself whether my conscience is not sensitive enough. I mean, do I ever actually listen to my conscience? Do I even consider that voice in my head? Do I ever consider it mid-action? I mean, he gets up willingly. He cuts it off. He goes back, he sits down, and his conscience breaks in. And he's listening. He's listening. Do we ever let it speak? And do we consider what it has to say? Or do we shut it down immediately? Oh, that's just silly. That's just silly. Do we let our consciences speak? Saul clearly, sorry, David clearly considered what his conscience had to say. The third thing, this kind of man does not flinch at genuine repentance. He does not hesitate, he does not avoid. Let's notice Saul's repentance before we come to David. It sounds genuine. Have a look at 24, 16 to 17. Let's read his. When David finished saying these things to him, Saul replied, Is that your voice, David, my son? The irony. You're hunting this man to death, and now he's your son. Then Saul wept aloud and said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have done what is good to me though I have done what is evil to you. There's Samuel's, uh, Samuel's, oh, I'm getting all the names wrong today. There's Saul's repentance. But just two chapters later, we read this in chapter 26. The Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah saying, David is hiding on the hill of Hakalah opposite Jeshimon. So Saul, what did he do with this nugget of information? 
accompanied by 3,000 of the fit young men of Israel, went immediately to the wilderness of Ziph to search for David there. The writer of 1 Samuel doesn't even change the number. It's almost like, almost like all 3,000 went on standby. Go home, but I'll what's up you when I need you. All 3,000, you must be ready. First opportunity he gets. He's forgotten his repentance. He's forgotten. Let's take note of an example of David's confession. Later in his life, when he committed adultery, with Bathsheba. And I can seldom read this psalm without feeling utterly shamed by this man. David speaking to God. For I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me, never forgotten. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived. There's no diminishing what he did. There's no explaining away. There's no extenuating circumstances. There's no one looking for someone else to blame. She shouldn't have been naked on the roof of her house. You hear that all the time. Women today dress so skimpily. That may be true. But look where David's sin started. There was no Bathsheba there when he was born. And he's not interested in just being sorry for an isolated incident in his life. He's declaring, I live in a state of sin. I was born in it. I'm aware of it every day. What happened here, yes, was horrible. But it's only a tiny microcosm of the sin that dwells in my heart every single day. That's David's response. It reminds me of an incident in my teens where, let me put it frankly, I was behaving badly. I was being a brat. And I felt like nobody was listening to me. Trust me, let me make it clear right now, public statement, nothing of what I was saying was worth listening to anyway at that stage in my life. But I decided to get on my grandmom's case and say to her, Granny, you never listened to me. To which she responded, I'm so sorry. I've been accused of that all my life. And I wish I listen more. I don't think she ever knew what a, what a statement that was for me. I deserved her accusation. I deserved her blame. I deserved her pointing the finger back at me. But she knew herself. She was all too willing to say I'm sorry. There was no reducing it. There was no eliminating it, trying to, you know, it's not that bad. She knew herself and was all too willing to say, I am sorry. Fourthly, this kind of man 
has an increasing desire to honor what God honors. And I think we're getting close to the core here. An increasing desire to honor what God honors. Have a look at verses six to eight again of our key chapter. David said to his men, I swear before the Lord, I would never do such a thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. I will never lift my hand against him, since he is the Lord's anointed. With these words, David persuaded his men, and he did not let them rise up against Saul. I think we all know what it means for us to despise our leaders, even hate our leaders, even fear our leaders. And there's no doubt that David had every right to despise his leader, hate his leader. To fear his leader, as his leader chased him all out over the desert, from cave to cave, determined to kill him. It's just, it goes against the grain that people take advantage of their leadership position. In your guts, you think, no, it's just so not right. So not right. But David will not touch this man. Why? Because he's the Lord's anointed. Irrespective of what this man does, the Lord honored this man. And so I will too. can have a look at 1 Peter. Now, Peter was writing also to a people suffering various trials, various difficulties, various hardships. And there's no doubt that that included the leaders of their day. And listen to the advice that Peter gives the people of his day. 1 Peter chapter 2, if you're going there, verse 13 to 15. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing Notice that, because of the Lord. Because of the Lord. He's not saying that these leaders are right, that they're even just. He doesn't say that, he doesn't even go there. Well, you know what many of those emperors were like. I think they make some of our leaders look innocent. They were brutal and barbaric. but you submit to them because of the Lord. For David and Peter, that was the only thing that mattered. That was was it. To Peter's mind and to David's mind, if a person is in a position of authority, they're only there because the Lord allowed it. There is no single person on planet Earth who can be in a position of power unless the Lord allows it. That doesn't mean the person's good, doesn't mean the person's right, doesn't mean the person's honorable. But incredibly, David hunted nearly to his death, refuses to disregard the fact that the Lord honored this man, and so I will honor him. Because of the Lord. 
And so notice the last verse of 1 Samuel 24. So David swore to Saul. Then Saul went back home, and David and his men went up to the stronghold. Now, the stronghold there is quite literally the cave. The cave in Engedi, various names, the cave of the mountain of the wild goats. That cave was the stronghold. We notice he didn't quite trust Saul. Saul went to go home to his palace. David didn't go home. He went back to his stronghold. David was no fool. But you can just listen. I'm going to read one of David's psalms. Now, this psalm was written on the day the Lord rescued him from the grasp of all his enemies and from the power of Saul. And this is what he said. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock, where I seek refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. Now, actually, that word stronghold in the original Hebrew is a different word. But the word fortress here. The Lord is my rock, my fortress is exactly the same word for stronghold here in 1 Samuel. And there it is for David. Whatever David, Saul does to him, whatever the circumstances of his life, whatever cave in the wilderness he's hiding, whatever is going wrong, the Lord is my stronghold. I'll listen to the advice of man but not if it contradicts my Lord. I'm willing to consider that I am a sinner rotten to my core and face the accusations because I know my Lord. I'm willing to consider that my way of thinking might be wrong because I know my Lord. Because I know my Lord. That was his source of dependence. Maybe he got that from his great-grandfather. Boaz, who I referred to earlier. Boaz, who was willing to risk his inheritance to redeem Naomi and Ruth. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a foolish thought that they would ruin their own inheritance. Boaz had every chance of ruining his own inheritance by taking on the responsibility of Elimelech's family. He really did. And yet, if you want to, you can go back and look, but at the end of Ruth, incredibly, Boaz is remembered and honored and associated with David, King David and ultimately with Jesus. God looked after his inheritance, looked after what was important, looked after the injustices being done to him. So I will look after it. You value what I value. You look to me for your support and your strength. I will look after what is yours. I will look after it. Today we can look to Jesus' example. And let this just flow over you. Beautiful passage in Philippians. Jesus Christ, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, 
he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. It is him who made the most profound statement as he cried out to his father just before the cross, Father, take this cup, this cup of suffering away from me, but not my will, but yours be done. How can we trust this? How can we trust that the Father will look after our interests? How can we give away to missions? How can we let our enemy go? How is it that we can let go all our anger at the leaders of our day? at those who may be hunting us or making our lives difficulty. How can we just let those things go? How can we treat them as light and fluffy and does not matter? Well, they do matter, but there's something that matters more. Going back to Jesus, when he died on the cross for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus utterly emptied himself, left himself dead on the cross Notice it wasn't Jesus who got himself off the cross. It wasn't Jesus. It was his father. He said, now I will bring you back to life. And I will give you honor and glory beyond our comprehension. And he says the same thing to us. In Jesus. In Jesus. If you know Jesus. If you trust Jesus. The Father says, I will bring you back to life again. And I have an inheritance far bigger than yours ever was. Let's pray. Father, we have in Boaz and we have in David examples of men who understood what it meant to find their stronghold, their fortress, their dependence in you. And understood what it meant to, to entrust their lives, their circumstances, their reputation, their inheritance to you. Such incredible examples. And yet, Father, you've given us an even more beautiful example in Jesus. That not only is an example, not only are we called to emulate him, make our attitudes the same as him, but trust in him. That even on the days we get it wrong, you will raise us to life because of your dear Son. Amen.